when we say, as we sometimes do in the church, that Jesus was a troublemaker, but a holy troublemaker, a, a causer of good trouble, sometimes that makes people scratch their heads. Sometimes they say things like, no, 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 Jesus is only always about keeping things in good order and maintaining law and order and decency. Jesus would not be into getting into trouble. And they wonder, what kind of good trouble could we mean? Here's an example. It's a story we're going to be taking a look at this coming Sunday in worship, and it comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, although you can find parallel stories in Matthew and Mark. In Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 26, they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And he stepped out on land. A man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tomb. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. It was, he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with them, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. That's good trouble. And what I mean by that is this is a story of Jesus refusing to leave well enough alone of Jesus deliberately entering a circumstance he knew would be provocative and then acting well aware that his actions was going to cause some kind of a stir and being willing to do it anyway because he was committed to helping set everybody free. And like that famous line attributed to Fannie Lou Hamer says, nobody's free until everybody's free. That was the trouble there in the land of the Gerasenes, which you kind of pick up the subtle hint as Luke tells it, this is Gentile territory, this is non-Jewish territory. Jesus has crossed to the far side of the Sea of Galilee. It's opposite Galilee. So we've now left the country. Jesus is now something of a, a migrant in Gentile territory outside of his own home province of Galilee, entering into Gentile territory. And there, these people raise pigs, right? Another telltale sign. This is not your local Jewish community. These are Gentile people. Jesus has deliberately provoked the situation by leaving Jewish territory and entering non-Jewish territory, where he's the outsider, he's the foreigner, and knowing that when he gets back home to Galilee, there will be plenty of people upset that he dared to cross that boundary. I mean, Jesus, from the beginning, knows someone is going to be upset with what he does. When he gets there to the country of the Gerasenes and sees a man that the rest of the community had given up on. They had made a devil's bargain and basically they were willing to trade his wellness and freedom for some level of decorum and civility and law and order for them, right? This guy was possessed, was, was, was overcome by these evil, unclean spirits, this legion of demons and the people had Maybe, maybe they meant well. They were like, well, look, if we just let him go free, he's going to cause all sorts of harm or damage, and we don't want him around. The most we can hope for is taking him out of town. We'll bind him up with chains and shackles, and uh, we'll, we'll just leave him there in the graveyard where at least he won't bother any of the living. They were willing to trade his life and livelihood and freedom for their own ordinary routines, right? 
we give up on our poor friend because we got to keep going on with life. So to shackle him up and leave him out there going nuts in the graveyard where at least he won't harm any of us and we can get back to business as usual and, you know, regular old life. Maybe they meant well because they at least thought they would keep him from doing something that could harm other people, or maybe he couldn't harm himself as much if they had kept him shackled. But everybody else had pretty much moved on with life as usual and were willing to give up on this poor guy because that's just the trade they were willing to make. They could be free and have their own lives because they didn't have to worry about him anymore. And Jesus steps into the scene, sees what's wrong, and instead of leaving well enough alone, instead of saying, oh, I see, if I set this guy free, Everybody else is going to be upset because he's the one, you know, uh, who's, who's causing all the trouble. If, if, I, if I help him, everybody else is going to be mad. Jesus disturbs the waters. Jesus troubles the situation in order to set this person free, this man who's been possessed by these spirits and doesn't even have his old identity anymore. He's, he's now been identified with the, the legion of demons that are in him. Jesus calls out the evil spirit. And when they plead with Jesus, these evil spirits who seem to recognize Jesus authority, pleading, all right, all right, fine, 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 we'll go, but let us do some damage on the way out, so let us go into those pigs over there. Jesus allows it, and this herd of swine, now possessed by these demons, runs off the edge of the cliff and drowns. And instead of the people being happy, instead of the people going, hooray, we get our friend back, we get our neighbor, I don't know what his name is, Phil, Bob, Greg, whatever, we get Greg back, instead of that... They're upset. They've lost their prophets. They're afraid that Jesus is going to cause more trouble. They had accepted a reality where one person had to suffer, and they couldn't do anything about that because at least it meant everybody else could get on with their lives and fulfill their life's dreams and go to work and do their business, all that kind of stuff. Poor Greg, whatever his name was, the guy with the demons, he, sorry, he was just the collateral damage, and Jesus refuses to accept that system. Jesus refuses to accept a reality where we write off some as unimportant so that everybody else can just get on by. Jesus sets this man free. And yeah, somebody loses their profits because their uh, herd of pigs goes off the cliff into the water. But instead of being joyful that they've got their neighbor back, the people are mad that they've lost their source of profit and that somebody's come to town to trouble the orderly, comfortable system they had set up. Someone's come to shake up the devil's bargain they've made to leave this man out in the graveyard. The beautiful thing about Jesus is that where he goes, he refuses to let people slip through the cracks and be treated like they're collateral damage anymore. Sometimes it feels like that's the best any of us can do. That's the best society can do is, oh, somebody's going to go hungry. Sorry, most of us will be fine. Just so bad that there's somebody who's going to go hungry tonight. Or too bad that there's somebody who's homeless and has no place to go tonight. Too bad that somebody's being taken advantage of or persecuted or mistreated or, or discriminated against. That's just how it is. Most of us will be okay. But too bad there's just poor, some poor people. They slip through the cracks and nobody means for them to get abused. But it happens. And I guess that's the best we can hope for. Jesus steps into situations like that and refuses to leave well enough alone, refuses to let us live with those devil's bargains we've made, and instead insists, like Fannie Lou Hamer's line says, nobody's free until everybody's free. The work we are called to be about as followers of Jesus has that kind of trajectory, to be about the work of helping everybody to be well and whole. Sometimes that means gathering them in to be a part of the followers of Jesus, the community of Jesus. Come, come, you'll, you'll experience freedom in a whole new way. Come and be a follower of Jesus. And, and sometimes that sends us off on missionary journeys like uh, Jesus sends his disciples out, whether to the neighbor next door you never bothered to talk to or somebody far, far away or, or in vocations serving the church or somewhere else you never expect. Sometimes Jesus doesn't send us far away, but right back into our ordinary lives. That's what happens with this man, the, the man who had been plagued with this legion of demons. He gets his life back. So when he pleads, Jesus, please let me go back with you, Jesus' response isn't mean. He's not punishing him. It's more to say, no, the whole point of setting you free was that you got your life back. Everybody else had cut you off, and they wouldn't let you, you know, have your family and your house and your job and all those things because you've been plagued by these demons. No, now you can have your life back. Go ahead and tell everybody there what God has done for you. He does. He tells everybody what Jesus has done for him. So God's reign still is advanced. The good news of Jesus is still shared. But this man does it simply by going back to his life free now for the first time in 
who knows how long. That's the work we are a part of. So sometimes it's very explicitly about naming the name of Jesus and helping other people to come to know him and have faith in him. Sometimes it's setting people free from the things that they are trapped in, helping people to be free with that wisdom that Jesus embodies. That nobody's free until everybody is free. And that Jesus' work is about setting people free, making people whole everywhere. If he has to cross boundaries and leave Gentile ter- leave Jewish ter- territory to go to Gentile territory, he will do that. If Jesus has to cross the boundaries and associate with the, the nobodies, the, the unacceptable, the, the sinners and outcasts, Jesus will cross that boundary. He crosses the line between clean and unclean, hanging out with lepers and people who have all sorts of contagious diseases. Jesus crosses the lines between men and women who are not allowed to talk with one another in public in that culture. Jesus keeps crossing boundaries in order that everybody can be set free. That's the vision. That's the life we are pulled into. And that's the conversation we're going to be exploring this coming Sunday in worship. How can we be a part of Jesus' work to help set everybody free, for everybody to be made well? And if that kind of conversation excites you or lights a fire under your feet, or you feel like you want to be a part of that kind of good, holy troublemaking, join us on Sunday where that's the conversation. See you then.